So thanks again, everybody, for sharing what you are grateful for in this season and letting us know where you are zooming in from. We're going to start today's webinar. It's called Nonprofit Tools, Tips, and Technology. It's presented by TAP Network. I'm Aretha Simons. I'm the webinar producer here at TechSoup. I'm just going to show you how you can engage today. I think many of you um, know that you are on mute. And if you need the closed caption, go ahead and tap on the bottom of the screen. To use the closed caption, you'll see the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Some people have already turned it on. Also, this is being recorded, so you're going to get the slides and the recording within the next 48 hours, probably by tomorrow, maybe later today, if technology acts right. So be looking for that. I want to share something new and exciting um, with you here at TechSoup. It's called Quad. If we can go to that Quad slide, I want to share that with you. Quad is something new that we have started here at TechSoup. I'm going to put the link to Quad in the chat. But what it is is a peer-to-peer -peer community here with inside of TechSoup. Um, we have ex exclusive events just for nonprofits. Um, you can get technical support. One thing that I love about Quad is that you can have access to the entire TechSoup courses catalog and 10 members from your organization can use it. So if you've even taken a course here at TechSoup, you know they can range from free to $10 to $90. But with that, you get access to the entire course catalog. So that's something to look forward to. So I'll put the link for that in the chat. But I'm going to turn this over to TAP Network. And you'll get to hear from Kyle and Julian. So thank you both for being here from TAP Network. I'm turning it over to you. Have a great webinar. Looks like I clicked on something. Ah, you, yeah, that's that's good. That that's the co-op membership is good for a year. So I'll put that link in the chat. So that that's not a problem. You you did the right thing. <laughs> you probably clicked on that hyperlink on the slide. So okay. while he's going back out to his slides, I just want to let you know that Quad is like he showed you is it is a membership. But again, it's this exclusive community just for members and it gets you discount on products, it gets you discount on other things in our catalog. But while we are also waiting, we've had some more people come and say what they're thankful for. So if you're just joining us, go ahead and type in the chat where you're Zooming in from and what you are thankful for. And we're going to start the webinar. Have a great webinar, everybody. <laughs> great. Thanks, Aretha. Sorry for that quick uh Outlink. Uh, as she said, my name is Kyle Barkins. I'm a co-founder uh, and CTO here at TAP Network. Uh, I'm joined today by Julian Tarashi on our team. Uh, he's our digital solutions manager. Um, I won't spend a bunch of time going through the, through our bios uh, and background, but we represent a, an organization named TAP Network. We are an exclusive partner with TechSoup, um, providing digital marketing, web website development, and digital transformation services for nonprofit organizations. We've been around for uh, going on 11 years tomorrow, actually, uh, and we've helped thousands of nonprofits um, transform themselves digitally, uh, launch, build, rebrand, redesign their websites, manage their entire sort of tech ecosystem um, and marketing space. So we're really excited to be here today with you to kind of go through some sort of some of the best practices uh, in the web uh, and marketing space, as well as answer questions you all have as we go through. We do want this to be more of like a collaborative session. So uh, hopefully I'm not just speaking, you know, Julie and I aren't just speaking the entire time. Uh, we just ask that you put those questions uh, in the webinar chat. We'll be able to go through those probably as, as we go and then address more of them at the end. Um, and as Aretha said, we will share these, this entire slide deck for you following the webinar. Uh, at that time, there will also be links in there to get in touch with us, uh, reach out for consultations, and, and kind of take the, these uh, like learnings or questions a, a bit further. So just a quick agenda for today. We went over the, uh, the intro to TAP. Um, we're going to kind of talk about nonprofit websites, what they are, what we see, um, some of the background here. Uh, how to building websites for a nonprofit or building websites in general. Um, we'll, we'll give you some uh, a high level overview, I think, of some tools and technology that we've seen uh, that is sort of like best best in breed, follow best practices for those. Uh, and then we'll follow that up with more uh, questions and answers. As I said, I would do want this to be collaborative. So feel free to, to drop some stuff in the chat and we'll answer those questions in real time. Uh, and you'll hear Julian and I kind of bounce, bounce some things off each other as we go. Uh, and then at the end, you know, we'll kind of, we'll show you guys an offer uh, and give you guys the links and, and access to reach back out to us um, following this webinar. 
So as I mentioned, um, if you go through TechSoup sites, just you know, a quick, easy way for, to get in touch with us uh, and to see some more of what we do, um, if you just go to the services drop down on the top of their homepage or any page throughout the site, you'll see uh, website service and digital marketing services. That's how you get straight to us. Uh, you can see a little bit more about some of the packages and things like that that we offer and learn more about how we can help some of the things that we do. So just to, as we said, you know, a kind of a, a, a full scale traditional marketing and technology agency covering everything from strategy all the way down through PR, uh, paid media, e-commerce, uh, SEO, and kind of everything in between. To get started, uh, so the stuff that's important to you, but enough about us. Um, why are websites important to nonprofits? So uh, I think somebody mentioned they're, they're thankful that we, you know, we've kind of come out of COVID, but COVID really, really shined a light on the need to, to do more, you know, as, as a nonprofit, as an organization, to be able to serve your communities, your volunteers, your constituents, um, to be able to message well, um, off, you know, online, uh, especially for the, the, the organizations that were kind of traditional, maybe brick and mortar or in person or in community. And the website is really the place that you're able to, to, to put your best foot forward and, and enhance, enhance engagement around the clock, right? And from anywhere in the world, really. Um, and then once you've got that, you've got someone there, you've got them engaging, you can do things like drive, drive donations, uh, recruit volunteers, uh, maybe, maybe you're an association, so you want to drive membership. Maybe you provide, um, you know, course courses and, and educational materials, so you want to be able to, to to put like a learning management system or webinars or things like that in place. But the website's a great place, um, and probably one of the only places you'll you'll be able to do that um, and and do that cost effectively and efficiently. Um, it's one nice one thing we saw, you know, also coming out of of COVID, but in general is it's a very budget friendly location as well. So, you, you know, very limited overhead on an ongoing basis. You know, you're not necessarily, you're not paying rent, um, paying for space, things like that uh, on this website. And it's a great way to get, you know, contextual, real time, updated uh, information out there and, and to engage with that audience of yours. On the, back, on the back end of that, it's also where you're going to collect data. So if you're running an ad campaign, if you're, you know, using Google ads, um, Google ad grants, if you're sending email marketing out, if you're doing blogging, if you're doing anything to try to drive people somewhere, uh, a website's a great place, one, to drive them, but also to be able to collect the data uh, and really see what, what what's happening. So, you know, I would say nine times out of 10, when we're, we're, we're talking to anyone, not just nonprofit organizations, they have this idea of who their, who their visitors are and who their audience is. And we're able to put, we put some, some data collection tools in place for them and we're able to actually show them, okay, maybe you're right, but but more than more often than not, they're actually not. Like they're either not attracting the right audience or actually, or they're attracting an audience that they didn't think of that they're not messaging for, but they're still getting to their website. So being able to track that, being able to see some of that insight is very, very valuable and important. Uh, and then it's also a great place and, and very important to focus on accessibility and inclusivity. Um, with more than a, I think a one in every four people in the United States has ident been identified as having some type of disability, whether that's like visual, text, you know, uh, touch, uh, actual physical, like physical disability. So the website is is a great place to meet those people on their terms and be able to provide value for them without having to have that barrier of a physical location or a non-accessible location or one that's not as, as inclusive. Yeah, and Craig asks, uh, what obvious error do we uh, see most often when first entering a nonprofit's website? And we see quite a bit, but I think one of the ones that sticks out and might be relevant for a lot of people here is just that they don't use the website as a tool. Like Kyle mentioned, you know, uh, these uh, these websites, they can do a lot for you. They can drive donations and, you know, uh, prevent uh, present these opportunities for uh, engagement. And when you're not taking advantage of that, uh, you have these very passive sites that become, you know, more of a chore to use or even, you know, might confuse the users. So you want to be able to provide um, uh, tools and engagement opportunities for those users, but also can help you by reducing a lot of administrative clutter and sort of uh, work that you have to do. If, you know, a lot of the stuff you're doing is just, hey, send us an email and we'll reach out to you. You know, you have all that administrative burden of needing to reach out to that person, get the information you need, rather than having integrations with your services or structured forms that capture that data at that first touch that allow you to be you know, more efficient and focus on 
on a lot of the stuff you do day to day versus doing a lot of this administrative work that you know might be solved by a lot of the stuff that's available for websites right now. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Julian. Uh, also on this call, you know, we heard a few people earlier on say that they're thankful for their funders, thankful for their donors. Uh, and so it's super, super relevant here to, to talk about some of the uh, the online fundraising statistics with with that website being a place um, where you're trying to drive that funding. Uh, we saw this is I think this data is from 2022. So we'd have it updated. We'd have updated information this year. Um, but online giving made up 8.7 percent. So probably more like more than likely over 10 percent this year of all fundraising. So when you think about these large corporate gifts, these large uh, family gifts, some of the traditional fundraising, to see this jump to, to that high of a percentage is, is pretty incredible. When you think about like the average size of an online donation versus, you know, uh, fundraising and donations in general. Uh, and then 63%, so getting close to two thirds of donors would rather, would prefer to give online with a credit card or a debit card. So instead of writing that, that check uh, you know, sending it in the mail or something like that, being able to giving them a way to quickly donate to your organization through, you know, a website or online. Uh, and then I, what, what's not, what I think is important is we'll talk through some, some of the, uh, the other steps here today is uh, 28%. So almost a third of all online contributions are coming from a mobile device. And we've seen that tick up year, year after year as more people are, are visiting from a mobile device um, and, and accessing you, you know, your, your organization probably maybe through social media or you know through an email or something like that they open online you want to grab a question i grab a question here as we go through these slides so um, so uh larry asks how should a home page differ from an about page that tells viewer what the organization is and does and uh, this is something we deal with uh you know a lot whether we're helping people with existing websites or or you know building a new one for them the home page is really uh, the, the the main landing page for the entire site. It should give an overview of of what you're about. All the different audiences you're speaking to should have a you know pieces of content and calls to action uh, specifically for them. If somebody lands on your home page, the uh, that page and all the con content on it should guide them towards all the other areas of your site. In contrast, the about page uh, tends to be more about you know more detail about the organization itself. Maybe that's where you include things like your your team members um, or or other things like that. Maybe your board, but the homepage really uh, is is a is a functional item that says, okay, here's all the here's all the programs we offer. Here's sort of where you can make donations. Here's this information, and it presents that all as an index for people to get through the entire site without needing to go up to the menu and you know find the relevant page if they're not quite sure. Having that that homepage there allows you to uh, build these calls to action that allow whatever audience you're trying to talk to, whether it's volunteers or donors or the people you're actually trying to help, they can say, okay, this is you know what I'm looking for. This is what's geared towards me. Um, and then you know you have an easy way to find them and send them towards the relevant information rather than have them search through everything manually themselves. Yeah, and then I think that that's a great lead into this, uh, to our next slide, talking about the different, like how, how a website fits um, but how your your sort of your digital presence fits overall into the overall marketing funnel. Um, so we we think about this starting at the top with the uh, the attract uh, stage when people don't know who you know who you are, don't know what your organization does, and are out there looking for you know, for something, whether that's like you know after school care for a child or um, you know help with a certain disability or um, you know raising awareness about a, a certain. Uh, cancer or disease or something of that nature or, you know, food sensitivity. So you're out there, you're interested, you're, you're trying to find out more about this. You don't really know where to start. And that's where things like search engine optim optimized websites, uh, pay-per-click ads, social media and blogging really help drive awareness to that. So that's the things you'll see that, um, that kind of pique your interest when you're, when you're browsing Facebook um, or LinkedIn or when you're cert when you're doing a Google search for something like that, those results that are showing up, these are people in the attract phase of this. As you go further down uh, towards the middle of the funnel, these are where you're seeing people that are, are sort of ready to support your cause and, and the mission of your organization. So they're looking to opt in in some way. They're going to say, "Okay, I like what you know. I like what your organization is doing. Tell me more." Uh, they're not ready to have a conversation with you. They're not ready to you know, sort of in the traditional way, they're not going to come into your, your building or come into your office, come into your organization, but they're starting to learn more about you. So like, okay, this seems like a good cause for me to donate to, or this seems like a good organization for me to volunteer. I might be interested in volunteering with. 
tell me more. And that's where they'll do something like opt into an email and say, you know, send me blog updates um, or send me your newsletter, or they might, you know, fill out a form to um, maybe attend a webinar or, or, you know, download your annual report to see where if, if they made an investment where their money might end up. Uh, and then from there on, you know, use, utilizing tools and use, utilizing a strategy, we're trying to drive them to, to activate, to, to do something to actually support your organizations. So that might mean coming to an event, right? That might mean um, volunteering for an event. That might mean donating or, or at least, uh, you know, jumping on the donation page. So you're tracking them through this entire funnel. We see where they came through and now see that they're, um, they've got some sort of intent to engage with your organization. And then finally, we want to turn them, that person, that donor, uh, that volunteer, that attendee, whatever that is, into a supporter so they can tell more people about your organization and drive those people back up into the top of that funnel. So that would be a way that would, that's where we would use the website for like relationship building. So, you know, if, you, if they become a membership, now a member, now you're, now you're guiding them through there by giving them um, some of the benefits of membership. So giving them exclusive content or something like that, or if they become a donor, you're telling them where, um, where their donations might be going, um, you know, like, let's say, say I donated $500 to a cause by, by engaging back with me and saying, thank you, Kyle, for your $500. It's gone to provide, you know, uh, coats to children or, you know, like jackets to children in need this, this winter so that they're not, you know, cold or, or, or something like that. This is where you would do that. And then what you want to do is give them the ability to tell other people about them. So, you know, share that you donated. I'm sure many of you on this call have either done this or seen this where you, you know, contribute to a cause and it's a, it, like one of the options it gives you is like to tell your friends or share with a friend. So just giving them that that capability, that ability through your site is a great way to continue to kind of keep this this marketing funnel full. Uh, another question we have here is uh, uh, Chemica. Uh, they ask, do we work with Squarespace websites? We typically don't. There's a lot of things we do that can integrate with any website, regardless of the platform you're on, whether we're taking a look at your search engine performance or helping you, you know, report or, or integrate with the donation tool. We do tend to prefer uh, uh, WordPress and, and a little bit of Wix in here and, you know, also very custom work. Um, this actually ties into a second question that, you know, might be getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but John asks, what CMS platform do you normally recommend, WordPress or Drupal, when a nonprofit organization has to manage its own backend for ongoing content, blogs, meta tags, SEO, and various performing uh, uh, management of donor management integration. So dealing with, you know, uh, contacting your donors. I heard that Drupal tends to offer a better solution in regards to accessibility and different languages. Is this true? So, um, you know, like I mentioned, we, we are a, a WordPress shop here for the most part. We find that's, you know, uh, one of the most popular and supported tools out there. So, you know, a lot of nonprofits integrate with, uh, you know, they may have a specific donation tool they use. There may be, you know, uh, other things they want to tie into it. WordPress tends to be a fairly universal connector. We're able to do uh, quite a lot. Then in regards to accessibility, um, that's not necessarily something that a, a specific site is going to be uh, uh, better or worse at. It's just where those tools are located. So adding your alt text, uh, to images, uh, making sure that you're structuring your content with header tags, uh, making sure your color contrast isn't too low. So people with, you know, impaired vision uh, can, you know, uh, still build that. So anything that you can do on one platform, for the most part, you can do on another. One of the things you might run into is this one might have a module that has a certain styling to it. So you have to, you know, use a slightly different uh, look to it. But all the, the core aspects of, of websites are going to are going to be found, you know, across many, many tools. I mean, then different languages, it really depends on whether you're trying to translate a web page, whether you're, you know, manually writing the content, for each language of that. So, you know, to answer that question, you really need to get into specifics, uh, but just to sort of stay on, on, the, on the top level, uh, we do like WordPress here. Yeah, I'll just add to that just, just for some, uh, I like this, this is a recent one, but for some clout, like NASA just put their website on WordPress. And I think if it's like good enough for a rocket scientist, it should be good enough for it's definitely good enough for us. Um, as, as Julian mentioned, um, we, we've, we've done WordPress websites for the last 15 or 20 years, 62%. Now I'll share these stats with you all as well. 62% of the hundred fastest growing companies in the United States use WordPress for their websites. So at least companies like the New York times, uh, Sony BMG, BBC America, um, they all use WordPress for their websites. Uh, and then, you know, you can, there's, there's a number of different, 
of different examples there, like different colleges and universities, like whitehouse.gov is on WordPress, for example. Uh, like the official website of like the country of Sweden is on WordPress. Uh, and what's nice about um, about something like WordPress is it has such a large development community and an ever growing development community. So, you know, if it's something, if there's something that you might get stuck on um, as you're going through building or, or if it's been put in place for you and you know, you know, 80% of it, but you can't get this yourself the rest of the way there, there's this, this massive community of like something like 40 million um, developers of sorts, people that can work within WordPress and this, this entire library of plugins that can do things uh, for you kind of bolt on pretty quickly, which makes it a very scalable platform if it's built the correct way. Um, for something like Squarespace, you know, Squarespace, Wix, Webflow, things of that nature, those are a lot, those are good, really, I, I like to kind of call these like the, the first website. So this would be sort of like a minimum viable product or something like that. So maybe you don't want to bite off more than you can chew. And we'll talk through some of that, like in the, in the, through the rest of this, uh, this presentation. Um, so we fought to that point, we follow what we call a growth driven design. So we are taking like a, looking at like the big picture, you know, where are you trying, where are you trying to go? Not just where you are now, but planning for that, for that growth. Um, what we've seen, what you see traditionally is a website will be this massive project, massive undertaking, very expensive and very time consuming. And you're making a, and typically you're making a bunch of uh, assumptions around what's, what's actually needed, you know, back to my earlier point, without understanding who your actual audience is, without, without understanding what they actually need and what they're, what they want to, what you want them to do on your website, what they want to do on your website and what they're actually going to do on your website. Um, so we take this growth driven approach, which allows us to iterate over that and improve over time um, without biting off more than we can chew up front. So that starts with a strategy phase. That's us taking a big look at everything, looking at the data you either you might already have or looking at like benchmark and industry data. Uh, and then we take that and develop a plan for something like what I, what I mentioned, like the Wix or the Squarespace type of website, but we would build it on WordPress so that we can scale it up as we grow. Uh, and that's what we call the Launchpad website. So that might be something that's like high level, very brochure, specific, brochure but specific, where it talks about what your organization is, who they serve, and give some key things that you can do on that site so that we can drive people to it, we can see how they interact with it, and we can, we can start to not make assumptions, but look at the insights and the data to say, okay, people are coming here to donate. People are coming here to do these things. One example I like to, I love to give is a website we built for the boy, one of the boys and girls clubs years ago. Um, they wanted us to put a donate button in the top right corner of the website. They're like, you need to put this up there. People are going to, they're missing the donation section of our site. And we put, we said, sure, we'll put that up there. It is important to see that you can donate on a site, but I, I, you know, I was pretty sure that no one was going to, click that button. And we left it up there, it ran for six months. One person clicked it. It was somebody at their organization. But in, in tandem, we built a better user flow for people to donate through the website. So that we, where we put, a, you know, on their homepage slide or in another place on their homepage, which talked about a donation and how they could donate, how they could get involved and where their donation went. So it gave some context. And we saw that boost three, three X, like 300% their donations from just, well, we saw their donations drive up 300% after we put that in place. So nothing to do with this button at the top of the screen, which you know was a, a kind of an assumption, but looking at the data and looking at what people were doing and updating that user flow for them. Um, so we, once we launched it, once we have that launch pad in place, then we go through this iterative process of like continuous improvement where we plan. So like, okay, what do we learn from our launch pad website? What should we do next? We launch that, we develop that stuff out. We add those features, we track, you know, the analytics and we learn from that and we transfer that data back into that plan and just kind of keep this going and growing over time. So you might start with like a five page website, you know, a couple months in, and then by the end of the year, you've got 17, 18 pages that are all driving, driving traffic, all converting, all adding to your SEO um, and, and adding to the engagement across your website. Yeah, uh, Roshani asks, uh, what themes and page builders do you prefer? And then asks, uh, what do you think of Elementor? And we love Elementor here. Um, it's, it's one of the things that we uh, we try and use as much as possible. Um, with it, you know, something that I think, in my opinion, contrasts Elementor to a lot of other sort of themes in there is that you're not necessarily, you know, using Elementor to provide you like a, a theme that you can use across the entire site. 
a lot of those purchasable themes, you know, they might work and then somebody stops updating them or there's a new version that you have to rebuy or something. Elementor allows you to really customize the theme exactly, you know, how you like, whether it's fonts and colors and, you know, any other sort of style like that. It's very user-friendly and very flexible. Um, so a lot of other tools that you might use not only integrate with WordPress, they integrate with Elementor as well, which makes, you know, developing and adding things and sort of keeping the site updated and functional over time very, very easy. Great. Um, so once once we've got this plan in place and we're starting to think about the design and we're building out this, this Launchpad website, across the board, and this doesn't just go for websites, this goes for emails, this goes for social media posts, this goes for anything you're designing. Um, you want to always make sure you're designing with the user in mind and optimizing for the user in mind. Um, so you can some just some quick tips on this. I'm not going to run through all these. And like I said, we'll we'll, we'll provide this after the call. Um, but like using white space and making sure that um, you know you're using like alt tags and things like that. So if it doesn't load on someone's browser, they can still see what's supposed to be on that page. Uh, giving creating a way that the user can quickly engage with your engage with your content and follow your content. Um, or your site throughout their their browsing experience. And one way to to really to to fine tune further on that is to um, design for responsive and design for mobile. So responsive web design is like this this idea that you can create a website that di that dynamically changes depending on what size the screen they're on. So whether that's a web uh, a laptop screen or a you know, a large format screen, like the maybe the one behind me, if I'm trying to share this with a group uh, or something small, like a mobile device, you're creating a responsive design. So you don't have to create multiple different designs or multiple different websites. Uh, and this allows you to kind of write write once or design once uh, and use it in many different places. So back to, to the question and Julian's point about, element, about Elementor, when we're designing things, we're designing them for Elementor, we're designing these elements there which will be sort of responsive uh, by default. And then it gives us the ability to, to tweak small things here and there to say like, okay, you know, on a, on a desktop, maybe this, these three things are side by side on a mobile device, we stack them top to bottom, but we don't have to create, you know, different content for web and mobile. Um, and the, the benefit of this is you get, you know, more mobile traffic if, if your website's optimized for mobile, back to that earlier uh, stat about donations from mobile devices. Now you've got more mobile traffic. Um, the site's gonna be faster because it's just it's still the same code, it's just different for web or mobile. Uh, and it's, you're gonna see higher conversion rates and a lower bounce rate and better SEO because you're not, you don't have duplicate content and things like that that exist out there that you would if you had, you were trying to manage multiple sites. Yeah, and I think this next question is going to uh, uh, fit really nicely with the next slide. So Rashani asks, tips for how to use Hotjar or other tools to understand how people are using the homepage. So Hotjar for people who aren't familiar is sort of like a, a, a heat map on your website. I find that while it is useful, a lot of the same stuff uh, you can get done by just being really smart about how you use Google Analytics. So you know after you spent all this time designing the site, now you want to see how people are actually using it. And you can't go ahead and you know call everybody who's ever used your website and say, you know, what'd you think? Where'd you go? You have to have these tools to sort of collect this data. It's it's free and it's very powerful. And so when you're sort of having these conversations of, you know, what should we change? You know, how are people using this? This can provide you a, a pretty objective, you know, uh, data-based backing for, for all those, those future efforts. So it allows you to see, you know, what pages people are using, where they go before. Uh, where they go after that, where they were before that. You can also track it, uh, conversions, like when people start a, a form but don't submit it, when they actually submit the form, they download any of your files, whether you have resource sheets or, or annual reports. You can also create custom events. So uh, Google Analytics comes with a bunch of pre-built ones, you know, when people play videos or how far they scroll. But you can also create ones where it's like, yeah, I want to see how many people click this button on this page. You'll be able to create you know, a custom event and, you know, track all the uh, single donate buttons across your entire site, be able to track um, those. When you combine that with a tool like Google Search Console, which is also, uh, you know, a free tool from Google, you really get a lot of insight into how people are getting to your site and what they're doing on it. So really, in order to, uh, uh, to understand how people are using the page, 
you know, set up uh, the things that you want to track is most important. You want to see when they get to, you know, page X, Y, Z. Maybe you want to use one of the path tools that will show you, you know, how many people started on the home page. Then, you know, maybe 10% went to this page, 30% went to this. And I'll give you a whole spider web to track these things. So it, it, it allows you to uh, visualize the data in a lot of different ways. But just getting this on here and collecting it, I think is going to give you a lot of insight into maybe what needs to be improved, what's working well. You spend a lot of time on this one landing page and you're seeing that people aren't able to uh, or, or aren't landing on that page or they aren't filling out the form on that page. That can give you sort of the uh, uh, the reason to say, hey, let's let's take a look at you know where we're linking this page from, what we're doing it for, uh, what we're doing uh, to get people here, the copy we're using on this page. It can really help you understand you know what the most efficient use of your time is going to be. So all that kind of bundles up into the need to you know be optimized for every user and. That includes, you know, making sure the website is accessible. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, according to the CDC, up to one in every four Americans have one or more disabilities. And a lot of those people with the disabilities uh, rely on like assistive technology to get on the internet. So that would be things like screen readers. So if they're visually impaired, uh, they have a tool on their computer that will read the entire, the, basically the web page to them. Uh, and if the page isn't structured correctly, if it doesn't have the right alt tags and things like that in it, it can get very confusing as it wouldn't make a lot of sense. So when you see pages that have a nice hierarchy and structure, so even something like, I'm going to go back a slide, um, but something like this where you see like, you know, there's a, a header on here and then there's bullets and then there's sub bullets, things like that are the hierarchy that, that, that should exist within a website so that it can be accessible, it can be read well by these screen readers. Um, similarly, I'm staying in that same vein, making sure like that the design is, is such that it is accessible. So there's a good contrast ratio. So there's, it's not a strain on someone's eye, um, when they're trying to read maybe like white text over a lighter background or a dark or like a blue background or something like that. Um, that's, that's, that has a high contrast ratio. So there's a bunch of best practices and things like that, that, that are really important to follow, to, to keep your site accessible and in compliance. Um, and then, you know, the other, the, the reverse stat of that is, um, if your website's not accessible, you could be ex basically excluding part of that, that, that audience. And it's this is where it's even more important to really understand who your audience is, because while this is relevant for everyone, you know, you need to make, it should be accessible. It should be one of the primary concerns of your website. This might be a big chunk of your market, right? This could be a big, this could be your, who you're influencing, who you're working with, who you're, who you're geared towards, who you're trying to engage with. Uh, so it's just very important to keep that in mind as you are, um, as you're building the, building these sites out and building out, you know, your digital assets. So going through this, we'll, we'll give you guys some, some ideas on like tools and technology and how, and how to keep these things aligned. Um, one of the things that we, we focus on is integration. Um, and this a lot, this is just kind of the concept of, of connecting your different platforms and technology to each other so that you're not manually moving things from one place to the next. And so you can share data across these different systems. So very basic example would be, you know, if you have a form on your website and it's collecting uh, information about donors, you want to make sure that integrates with your donation management system. And you want to make sure your donation management system integrates with your email marketing system. That way you're able to collect data from someone push them into your donation management system, and then use your email marketing platform to engage with someone who has who has or hasn't donated to you in the past, right? To be able to pare those things down. And if you have this integrated well, that information runs right back, kind of runs back in this nice circle to each other where you send them, and let's say Julian comes into our website and we see him fill out a form. He's interested in learning more about donating, but he doesn't donate. And then I come to the website and I do donate. Well, Julian and I should receive different messages in the future from our email marketing platform. And if we don't have these tools connected, we can't do that. But the value of having the tools connected is think about all the time that saves and the efficiency that gives you as, a, as an organization. So you don't need a person in there like sorting through spreadsheets or, or you know, coming up with all these different things if you, if you integrate and automate these things well. So... We like to look at like the entire sort of ecosystem. So just some of the questions um, earlier on like what platforms and things like that we recommend. We, we want to break these things into these different buckets, right? So um, we look at the platforms that you might use. 
these aren't, some of these are either or, some of these are, are, are in, in addition to each other, but we want to look at stuff like putting tools together and making sure that you're integrated across that whole ecosystem. So these are sort of some of the best, best in breed, best practices types of tools that we recommend. Starting with content, you know, you need a, a place that's going to, allows you to speak to your audience, right? So that could be through Wix or WordPress website, uh, and then using tools with, within those websites like Wufu for forms, um, Optimizely for, for different digital campaigns. And then, then you want to be able to message them. So my earlier example, you know, use, taking someone from your website, pushing them into your email marketing platform like MailChimp um, or, or something like that, that you're going to be able to, to messaging and engage with them over time. And then move that into to, to, to some type of automation platform as well. So there's some basic automations in something like MailChimp, but some of these plat these tools like HubSpot, um, you know, Marketo, Zapier allow you to do more advanced advanced automation. So if this happens, do this thing. If this doesn't happen, do this other thing, and and take out and limit some of the uh, the manual work your team has to do. You could do the best. You you might be the best at at the first half of this. But if you're not reporting on this, if you're not collecting and tracking this, so as Julian mentioned earlier, like the importance of something like Google Analytics, uh, you're not going to know. You're not going to put be putting your best foot forward, you know, going forward to say, okay, well, how did this campaign work? You know, you might anecdotally say we got a lot of donations, but you want to be looking at the analytics and make sure the tools are in place to say, how can we improve that? What could we have done better? What you know, what did work? What didn't work? Uh, what did we try and what didn't we try? Uh, and that allows you to set that strategy. So back to our earlier example on growth-driven design to plan and iterate things over time. And then what we're seeing, you know, what we're starting to see more and more of um, is looking at data. Like how do we consolidate all this data in one place? You know, we're getting data from different platforms. So we might have these things integrated, but how are we looking at data? So data is, is, is separate from reporting. That could be things like all of your donor data, all of your offline do donor data, your internal donor data, your donors in MailChimp, your donors in these different systems. So there's some tools we've laid out here as examples um, that allow you to, to look at that at, a, at like a, a more of a macro level and then be able to slice and dice down into that actual data itself. So kind of make sure to think about that separately um, from reporting. And Audrey asks, uh, sort of, uh... More specific to WordPress, yes. Are there any uh, specific WordPress plugins or plugin types that you rec recommend as important for nonprofit websites? So if you look at how all these uh, sort of icons are, are organized, you can see that okay, each company does something specific, and I would I would suggest that you think of plugins that same way. Don't necessarily look for a certain plugin to add it because you want to add it. You know there are you know with WordPress being so popular, there are plugins in there that will add like a, a funny joke to your dashboard. You know, every day when you log in, don't don't install any of those, but sort of uh, identify the functionality you need and see you know uh, what's out there. Some things you might want to look at are a form plugin. You know, maybe your theme has a built-in one, or you want to use the uh, the WordPress form option. But a tool like WP Forms or we really like Gravity Forms, you know, gives you the ability to um, have multi-page forms. You know, even collect donations or stuff through it. If you want to customize who gets response emails and stuff, you know that can really uh, uh, reduce a lot of the administrative burden on you just by using a form tool like that. Another thing might be a cache. So for WordPress sites, you know uh, something that can really speed up the performance is is having a cache available. Um, so there there's lots of things that you you can do on a WordPress site, but I really evaluate you know what you're doing on the site, what you're trying to do on the site, and then sort of bridge the gap with those plugins. So there's not necessarily a lot of ones where you're saying okay, install this right away. Um, but just really uh, uh, take a look at what you're trying to do and map uh, your, your plugin needs according to that. Always rely on, you know, there's a plugin that maybe has three people who've downloaded it ever. Maybe stay away from that one. Um, but sort of uh, with that, you're going to find lots of options that are available for you that depending on what you're trying to integrate with or connect, um, there'll, there'll be quite a few, uh, quite a few options. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and then now everybody's favorite and, and new buzzword for 2023 uh, is is AI. I know this is like kind of the the wild wild west, especially in the nonprofit space, uh, and it can certainly become like the shiny object. Like, what should I be using? What you know? What can I be using? Should I, why am I not using it? Um, and you, if you've joined some of our other webinars, we've done a few so far on AI and some specifics. We've got a bunch more coming up in 2024, um, but. 
AI is a great tool if you're using it, you know, correctly, efficiently, effectively. It can also be a, a major hurdle and a major drawback if you're not. Like, you know, if you're just being very reliant on it and letting it do everything for you, not proof checking, not, you know, not not making sure that um, the, the information is accurate. You know, we re read more and more and see more every day of what, what they what's called like hallucinations, which is kind of like where AI just makes something up. Um, because it, it makes these generalizations based on the large language models and the things it's using or the the uh, the data it has. So it's important to kind of keep keep it in the lane. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't use it for some great things like brainstorming. So we love it for like ideation, um, for you know audience like growth and, and background. So there's a bunch of different things we listed out here. I'm not going to go through every single one of these things in detail, but using something. Um, like Notion to, to allow teams to, to collaborate together and, and work on like automating tasks. So using an AI agent or an AI bot to do things for you, to consolidate things. So back to the, the data earlier, like you can load some data into AI or into an AI platform and say, okay, I want to see all the donors who donated more than $5,000 last year. And then you can ask it to do that. And you say, okay, you know, create, a, create, a, um, create an email for me with a, a subject line that's going to you know, ask them to to donate more in in 2024, and give me three paragraphs that that highlight the the key re, the key learnings or key things you know that our organization did that did well this year, and then you give it like your your URL and you give it a little bit of background and you let AI kind of summarize that stuff for you, and now you've come up with you know I mean it maybe takes you five to ten minutes to 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 prompt it to put that information in there, and obviously it gets it's more complex than that, but. Now you've taken the like, ideation stage out of it. You've taken the the time you have to sit down and think about writing this thing. And then if you create a nice little formula or template there, that's something you can re reuse and repurpose in the future. Again, relying on the on the the reporting and the data that you're collecting to see how that's performing and iterate over that over time. Um, there's also things like Canva and you know these some of these different like mid journey tools. Um, Dolly, like the ones that allow you to also create like these these kind of compelling graphics uh, or or uh, visuals from with from from uh, from like an AI prompt. But again, same thing there. Make sure you're taking a look at these. You know, uh, you see these these things where it, you ask it to create you <clears throat> people doing things, and those people have seven fingers on one hand and three fingers on the other hand, or three eyeballs, or their T-shirts have like really strange writing on them. So. You gotta you gotta keep an eye on what it's what it's creating, but it's a great way to 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 do some brainstorming and do some some content creation. Uh, and on the other side of that is all of the all of the, like the remedial tasks and things like that that AI can do for you. So think about like voice tools for like uh, dubbing videos, uh, for translating different things, for transcribing different videos, uh, or like using video AI tools to to you know put an, an AI avatar. Um, you know, in a webinar or something like that for you. I promise you I'm a real person, but I could, we could write this, uh, this, this webinar today and, and give it a script and we could have someone sit here that, you know, kind of looks like me, probably talks a little bit less robotic since I seem like, I think I talk like a robot sometimes. Um, but we, I could, I could quickly have like another version of myself, so to speak. So if you have a small organization, you don't have the time, you know, to create video content, you don't have the time to create these webinars. This is a very viable alternative to that, um, you know, if it's used used correctly. So a great way to sort of scale capacity um, for you and your organization or even scale expertise. Yeah, uh, before we jump into uh, all the other ones, Roshani has an AI specific one. She asks, any AI tools help the Google Analytics and Search Console reporting? Um, a lot of uh, uh, what's in Google Analytics and Search Console, all right, Search Console to a lesser extent, but definitely Google Analytics is AI. So a lot of the ways that they're sort of building reports and suggestions is through artificial intelligence. Then to sort of like uh, to help with the actual reporting and stuff like that, there may be things where you just want to look at, at exporting the data from one of those tools and importing it into different visualization options. I will say that once you start exporting Google Analytics data, that does get quite large quite fast is they're, they're, they're capturing a lot. One of the benefits of the platform is just how they make it available to you. So it's not necessarily the uh, the raw data that is the, the biggest help in Google Analytics. It's that raw data combined with the, the different views and, and tools they have to allow you to, to visualize that. But there are, you know, 
a lot out there if you just want to, you know, create different graphs or, or have interesting queries into how some of this data uh, overlaps. Um, uh, there's quite a bit out there. But now we, we have a little bit of time left. Um, I see, you know, one question in the chat. If you would like to put um, any questions in the Q&A here, um, we're here to help. So, you know, uh, throw it at us and we'll, we'll definitely answer it. To kick things off, Emma Z asks, what online donation payment system do you suggest? I've seen PayPal and Square, but if I'm thinking correctly, they take a percentage of the payment. So there, you know, there's quite a lot out there. Depending on the platform you use, there may be things like WordPress's GiveWP, uh, GiveButter, B-U-T-T-E-R, is also one that, you know, uh, if you have a certain badge on the form, they don't collect a fee, and they also, um, you know, have an option for the users to cover the actual transaction fees. Depending on, on what tool you actually use, uh, one of the things you are going to run into is a, a, a percentage for payment processing. So, you know, a lot of these tools, they aren't building their own payment processors. They're using something like PayPal or Square or Stripe on the back end, which carries their own like 2.9, 1.9%, whatever, whatever that's going to be. So uh, a lot of it uh, doesn't necessarily come down to, you know, a, a specific free one, though Give Butter is the best sort of low cost, close to free as you can get option. Um, a lot of it comes down to, hey, can we tie this into maybe a donor management platform? Can, you know, if you're going to, you know, uh, uh, pay for use of a tool, can you get additional features in it to be able to, you know, capture that donor information, send it to your email lists, send it to uh, maybe a, a different CRM? So uh, th there's quite a lot out there. It really depends on on what platform you're using, um, but uh, there's there's plenty plenty out there. Uh, one isn't necessarily better than the other until it comes down to those additional features you're going to get. Everybody will be able to process a credit card. Not everybody's going to allow you to maybe email users directly from the donation management platform or create different lists or allow people to donate to specific funds. Depending on, on what you want to do, there's going to be uh, uh, better options or worse options for you. Great. Any other questions? We've got a few more minutes here and a couple more slides just to, to share some offers with you all, but definitely make sure we cover anything we mm -hmm. missed. Well, I'll keep going and look for look for some more questions in the chat. Um, one thing we wanted to offer you all uh, is uh, we we put together a a book of eighty or more uh, Chat GPT prompts specifically geared towards nonprofits. Um, so we offer this as to you all on the webinar today. There will be a link in this um, in the slides that you'll get either later today or tomorrow. That'll take you right to that that ebook um, where you can get that kind of the prompts. The prompts are, are really a lot of the building blocks that are necessary for getting uh, Chat GPT or these different um, AI tools to do what you need it to do. You can't just say, hey, build me a website, right? Or, or you know, write write my content for my website. You have to give it the right um, the right background. You have to have it, you have to answer the correct questions and things like that. So that it's, there's a little bit to it. Um, and we've, we've put some of that stuff together for you to, to really help drive these outcomes for your nonprofit organizations. We do have a question here from uh, John, who's, who's asking about uh, tracking. He asks, uh, getting the uh, conversion and tracking is very important. Uh, it informs the machine learning for Google Ads. When you set up a website, how do you know the difference when you are setting up the conversion tracking for Google Analytics 4 or Google Ads? So Google Analytics 4 and Google Ads are two separate products made by the same company, um, and, and they, they can work together, but no, don't necessarily by default. So when we talk about a conversion in Google Analytics 4, we don't necessarily do anything to the website to say, hey, this is a conversion. What we say is, hey, Google Analytics, these are the things that I want to count as a conversion. You can say, when somebody goes to this page and just views it, that's a conversion. So you can set that up um, uh, however you'd like. You can use all those, those event types we talked about uh, uh, before, or this downloading, form, uh, downloading uh, uh, files, starting forms, things like that. And you can set any of those up as a conversion. You can then use those to build audiences that you target in Google Analytics, I mean, in Google Ads. When we're talking Google Ads, sort of a bit of, a, of the reverse. So, you know, you have to set up the, the correct landing page. Hopefully, when you're setting up these Google Ads, you're not just sending somebody to the homepage of your website. 
you're sending them to landing pages that allow them to convert on a specific action. You don't just want to send somebody to the general, you know, front page of your website to have them go there as any other user. If they're clicking on the ad. You've probably really got their attention on something, and you want to make sure that attention is rewarded by, you know, being efficient with what you're providing them. Sending them to one place where they can understand, you know, what you're trying to do, who you are, and make that conversion option, whether it's donating, uh, signing up for an event, downloading a resource. So um, those are going to be two separate uses of the word conversion, and they're each going to be very platform specific. We also have um, uh, one from Kate here. Our website is already hosted on Squarespace, and our payment system is Square. We've been having trouble integrating the two. Have you ever worked on that? Do you have a third-party platform suggestion for that or an easy way to integrate? So it really depends on the issue you're having. I know a lot of you know payment systems, uh, you know, might have the ability to embed an iframe, which isn't the most responsive or greatest option. But you know, if you're looking to sort of get something up quickly or just patch it, you can always just create an iframe, which is basically like a window that you know uh, a Square can fit in, you know, their own contents. Um, I haven't personally connected the two. Kyle, have you ever worked with Squarespace and Square together? Uh, I have in the past, and I remember it being annoying um i i don't remember exactly what what the um what we ended up doing to overcome overcome that it might even actually been moving moving it off of there um or using something like i think zapier to to integrate the two yeah that, that's another a good tip a lot of times when two things don't necessarily work together by default a tool like zapier can really bridge the gap um, and, you know, it turns something that might be, you know, incredibly complicated and, you know, might have you trying to change your entire tech stack to something that, you know, allows you to unlock even more potential than you thought was there in the beginning. Um, Valoria asks, for the not-for-profit with not much budget and no in-house experts, how can we get started in making progress with the various things mentioned in this webinar? Updating or upgrading the website, security on the website, using AI, uh, moving strategically to the next stage, accessibility, it's overwhelming. And so, you know, there, there is quite a lot there. A lot of it comes down to prioritizing and seeing, you know, what work can you do now that won't sort of either need to be duplicated or made irrelevant by the stuff you plan to do in the future. So the first step to sort of taking all this sort of stuff you've heard here is really sitting down and, and, and prioritizing it. So if you're thinking, okay, well, you know, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to, you know, uh, update the security on this site and, you know, working a lot on that if I know that I, I need a new website too. It might be better just sort of get that website up as quick as possible and then make sure it's set up, you know, well security-wise there. So you can always, you know, uh, contact us and we can sort of help you prioritize and give you more context on things. Um, but if you're just sort of doing this on your own, we work, you know, the uh, not much budget and no in-house experts. Uh, we work with um, a lot of uh, organizations like that, but it's really just coming down to uh, prioritizing that and making the plan that you can then take down step by step by step. Um, I'm on the board of a small nonprofit that's had a fairly simple website on HostGator for many years, but is frustrated with their support. They're looking at moving to DreamHost and the Astra theme. Any quick pieces of advice or warning before they pull the trigger? Um, I don't have anything specific. I know if you're moving a theme as well, that might involve a lot of sort of like uh, uh, page edits and sort of, you know, you have to mess with stylings and, you know, re-adding content. So, you know, it may be a bit of a bigger project than you want. If you're changing the theme and the host, maybe see if that's something you can combine to a full website rebuild and make sure that, you know, a lot of the stuff that you're trying to do actually serves your website and take that as an opportunity to sort of break it down and plan it out, really build build a nice house on top of that. Uh, Joellen uh, asks, can I ask what the average cost is to set up a website, small, not-for-profit, et cetera? And so that really depends on what you want the website to do. So, uh, you know, Kyle, I know we work with, with a lot of, you know, uh, uh, different uh, organizations, depending on their size and sort of uh, the needs of their website, that's really going to, you know, uh, determine exactly exactly what the final cost is going to be, whether it's a basic site, or, or a uh, you know a, a very intensive set like we might do for one of the uh, the state departments here. Um, what do you think a good range would be? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I'll I'll say kind of what I mentioned a little bit earlier, like looking at maybe an MVP or like a proof of concept type of website first. So 
Um, if it's a small nonprofit that doesn't have a website or has something that's kind of, that's very outdated, it's probably in your best interest to try to try something that's almost like off the shelf uh, and then having a really strong content strategy around that. So, you know, one website versus another versus another might not look that much different. They might have more, you know, different colors, different photography, and but just have different content, right? Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of different templates and themes and things like that out there that exist, especially like when you look at stuff like Wix and um, like Webflow or something where it's going to have it, you have a template that has, that takes best practices into account that is mobile responsive. And all you kind of need to do is drop your stuff in there and, and make it work for you. That would be like the, the, the first approach I would, I would look at if you have um, the bandwidth uh, you don't, you shouldn't have, you should need limited techno technical expertise to do that, to get something out there that's, that speaks about your organization, but content is going to be the big, the big hurdle, the big lift. Um, that is, whatever time it takes you to do that. As far as outsourcing it, having someone else do it, you know, uh, there's certainly things like Fiverr and Upwork or whatever. You could go find someone else to, to do like the actual build for you, but then you're going to really have to kind of like con general contract it, so to speak, and manage that whole project. And that could be very uh, time consuming and inundating. That's going to be where you're, you're but that's going to be the lowest cost, but it's going to be a pretty big time suck, I think for you. And, and you're probably not going to get what you want at the end of it. Um, our websites, when we do websites for nonprofit organizations, they usually start in like the $15,000 range, but that's like over a period of time. So it's not just like a one, you know, this is it, whatever. Those are also typically the websites that are, you know, we're going to do a custom design. We're going to do, we're going to work, work, work with you on like the, the whole content flow and content architecture. We're going to look at what you have now. Um, actually it's actually on the screen right now. So you can see what it says. So we start with this strategy. We do like a discovery content audit and the scope of work to really say, this is what we're going to do for you. Um, we do like the site structure recommendations and the website design. We develop it. So we, you know, we, we follow best practices and build it on WordPress. Uh, and then we QA it, test it and launch it. So it's really the full, the full package. Um, and that's, like I said, it usually starts around like $15,000. It's not, you know, it, it's, it's a good chunk of time that it takes on our end. It's a, there's a lot of, of um, like, you know, customization and, and specific, like learning specifically to you all, to you, you or your organization that, that goes into that. But, you know, the, the package on the end of that is going to be, it's going to work for, it's going to, you know, work for your audience. It's going to fit your audience. It's going to follow those best practices. It's going to use our, you know, years and years of experience. Um, and it's going to be, you know, secure, optimized, um, accessible, all of those things. And uh, so the, the last question I'm seeing right now is uh, which uh, WordPress hosting platform do you like the best and why? There's quite a lot out there. Um, uh, we like SiteGround. One of the main things you're going to want to take a look at is sometimes you feel like you might be getting a really good deal, but you might not have a lot of space or bandwidth on there, or you might be, you know, packaged with other sites that can make the site really slow to use. So, um, uh, there's there's plenty of options out there. Some people even uh, you know uh, build their own servers and host it out of their basement. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that unless you really 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 know what you're doing. Um, but uh, just take a look at the actual sort of services that you're provided. There's also two types of WordPress hosting. You have sort of passive and manage. So passive hosting is where you're basically providing uh, you're you're paying for access to a a, a computer somewhere that you're going to put your website on. And they'll hook it up to the internet. Then there's managed hosting, sort of like we do here, where we're taking a look at your site. You know, we'll be able to respond to issues. Uh, you know, uh, update plugins, keep things up to date. You know, if there's any sort of uh, security issues, getting those patched and stuff uh, right away. So really take a look at at sort of uh, what's being provided. Um, you know, and also if you want to talk to us about it, uh, we'd be more than happy to sort of go through all that. Thanks, Jordan. We have about a minute left, so I just want to wrap up, uh, wrap this up. <laughs> um, we have. As we said, we'll have a, uh, this will be linked in the PDF slides, but you can also find it on, on TechSoup's website. Again, if you go to that services tab at the top of the screen and pull down either web development or or, uh, or digital marketing, you'll find access to, to book a consultation with us. Um, and you'll see that here as well. Um, our emails will be in this too, I believe. Uh, I, so you guys will be able to reach out to us following this webinar once we send this the, the PDF slides and everything else like that out to you all today um, or tomorrow at the latest. Uh, so I just wanted to wrap this up by saying thank you to you all. Uh, we appreciate you kind of um, 
engaging with us, asking these great questions, uh, and, and sort of taking the step forward to um, to hopefully optimizing and improving your, your website and your web presence as a nonprofit organization.